Good afternoon, everyone. You're all very welcome to this week's Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar. My name is Michael Malouli, Alumni Relations Executive here at Trinity Development and Alumni. This afternoon, we are honored to have with us the Provost, Provost Patrick Prendergast, who will be speaking about his time as Provost of Trinity College Dublin. Our talk today will last around 50 minutes, including questions and answers from the audience throughout. And we are aiming to finish up at about 2 p.m. Irish time. We encourage you to submit questions you have for the Provost throughout the webinar by using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen if you're watching on Zoom. If you're watching on YouTube Live, you can submit questions in the comment box there and they will be passed over. This webinar is being recorded for later viewing. If you are watching on Zoom, you will get a link to the recording after the webinar. The recording will also be available to view on the TCD Alumni YouTube channel. Now I'd like to introduce and hand you over to today's host and MC, Jennifer Taff, Director of Alumni and Supporter Relations here at Trinity Development and Alumni. A communications and university advancement expert, Jennifer has had a highly distinguished career here at Trinity. She assumed her current role as Director of Alumni and Supporter Relations in 2019 and is responsible for engagement with our wonderful alumni community around the world, including everyone listening in today. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm sure today's guest doesn't need that much of an introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. I'm delighted to be joined today by Provost Dr. Patrick Prendergast, who was elected by academic staff and student representatives as the 44th Provost of Trinity College Dublin in 2011, and whose tenure ends in July. The Provost is the Chief Officer of the University, responsible to the Board and ultimately to the State for the performance of the University. Dr Prendergast hails from County Wexford and he came to Trinity as an undergraduate in 1983 where he also completed his PhD. After postdoctoral positions in Italy and the Netherlands, he was appointed to the Engineering Faculty in Trinity in 1995. As Professor of Bioengineering, he introduced the teaching of biomechanics into the curriculum. During this period, he was a Science Foundation Ireland principal investigator and held many industry funded and EU funded research grants. Dr. Prendergast is a member of the Royal Irish Academy, a fellow of the Irish Academy of Engineering and an international fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK. Leadership positions in the college prior to taking up the provostship included Dean of Graduate Studies and Vice Provost. So Provost, you're very welcome here today to speak to our alumni and friends tuning in. Thank you, Jennifer. We've, been, right. we've been inviting questions over the last few weeks, so there's quite a lot to ask you about. Um, let's start by, start by taking you back a little bit, um, Provost. You entered Trinity College at 17 years of age. What inspired you about the college then, and what continues to inspire you about it now? Yes, 1983, I'd done the leaving cert and uh, decided, of course, to go to university and to do engineering. And I had a few options, could have went many places in the country. Uh, and I, I, I can't really tell you why I put down Trinity College Dublin Engineering first, uh, and not UCD or Cork or somewhere like that, but uh, um, I think it was the right decision. I wanted to come to a great university, a university with a reputation and so on. Other universities in Ireland have that too, of course, but Trinity has it in spades. Uh, and. I put down Trinity and really never looked back after that. And do you think college is a very different place now to how it was then? Uh, well, I mean, of course, there, we have the internet now. We have uh, many things that are, are different, of course, uh, com in comparison to back then in, in 1983. Uh, uh, so it's different for sure, but recognisable all the same. I mean, you, you walk into Front Square and you see the same buildings. You walk into New Square and Botany Bay, you see the same buildings. You walk uh, uh, through into College Park and there's College Park and there's the rugby ground. And uh, so there are many things that uh, uh, are very familiar. Um, at the same time, uh, many things have changed and changed for the good. I think the values and the thing that motivates staff and students is much the same. A kind of a, a desire to do great research certainly motivates the staff and to publish it. And, and very importantly, of course, teaching and um, engaging with, with undergraduates 
uh, and, and postgraduate students, increasing number of postgraduates, of course, uh, is what motivates the college. So uh, many things are quite the same. You know, we still have much the same clubs as we had when I was a student, for example, and they're still moving away. Uh, the college um, literary magazine Icarus was just issued last week. You know, you can pick it up around college like you could do in 1983 and like you could do in 1973. So many things are the same. And I think uh, it, the college is recognizable to alumni who come back. But many things are different too because life has changed. It's true. So you took up the position of provost in the midst of the economic crash, um, or maybe when we were just starting to recover, and now you're leaving during COVID. So you really haven't had an easy time of it, have you? Well, I've had a great time of it. I've had an enjoyable time of it. That's more important than having an easy time. Sure, uh, 2011 and uh, the crash and the recession that followed uh, 20, 2008 were very challenging times for all universities around the world, but particularly think back to the situation Ireland was in. Ireland and a few other European countries, um, you know, I, don't, I mean, it was terrible. They were even called the pigs, if you can remember that. And uh, these countries had a terrible time um, because of overhang of public debt and organizations like universities that have significant public funding were affected by that. Thinking back to then, I, mean, I had to implement salary cuts on all employees in the university. And when I tell that to people around the world, they realize how bad it was in Ireland uh, at the last recession. But these are times of opportunity as well. And we certainly here in Trinity identified that there were ways we could uh, take control of our own destiny by what happened in the recession. Uh, a greater attention paid to financial thing matters by leadership around the college, uh, increasing revenues in various different ways, um, including importantly, of course, through philanthropy, but uh, not, by no means solely that. Uh, commercial revenues of all kinds. I remember saying to a person when I just come back from Boston, um, or just actually, uh, I'd come back from Boston seeing how well they were doing there in some of the universities in merchandising. And walking up Grafton Street, I would see people wearing Harvard hoodies and Harvard t-shirts. And I said, what's going on here? Why can't we be doing some of that? Uh, and we started to do a lot more commercial activities, of course, and um, be much more globally engaged in recruiting students from around the world. Uh, more postgraduate students and we really turned around our financial fortunes and started to use the revenue generated to improve academic activities, more scholarships, more lectureships, uh, maintenance programs on buildings, developing and putting up new buildings. So it was a difficult time and of course now, but we, we climbed out of it and now we're going in to another potential recession with the consequences of the pandemic, although it's not possible to fully predict the economic future yet. As a consequence of the pandemic, maybe it won't be as bad as we think, or maybe it'll be much worse. But whatever way it is, Trinity is ready for it. We know we can deal with difficult financial situations and emerge uh, stronger and better. So I think you would absolutely have expected to be dealing with a lot of um, financial issues and financial hardships during the 10 years when you took on the role. Is there anything else that has dominated the last 10 years that you mightn't have expected or couldn't have foreseen? And let me leave COVID out of that for a second. Um, I think one area that is dominating uh, and that perhaps we weren't as ready for as we could have been is online education and the whole uh, technologicalization of uh, interactions between student and uh, teacher. And uh, now the pandemic has accelerated that for sure, but this has always been going on in the background over the last decades. Uh, Trinity prides itself, of course, on, on human um, connections and relationships uh, through clubs and societies and in the individual relationships between teacher and student. Um, and we want to keep that. We're a residential university. You know, thousands of students live here on the campus and in Trinity Hall. Uh, we want to keep that. We see the value of that. But the challenge of how to 
to do that simultaneously with recognizing that the world is changing with regard to technology and information technology in particular. I think that's a challenge I didn't foresee perhaps as much as I should have. We engaged and we're still engaging. Um, and I think many universities like ours that have our kind of traditions uh, are going to have to think harder about how they use IT better and technology better in general, uh, while still maintaining the core of what's important in how students and staff uh, interact. So there's one, I could talk about more challenges. That's there's one, and I mean, probably going to get to it later with COVID, but just may as well um, take it now, but like that could have a big impact on the student experience and maybe on collegiality and on like all the people joining us today who are uh, our alumni um, who would have had a very particular experience on campus and now the students who are there today may not be having the same experience although I'm sure they're having a good experience in their own way but you know do you think that it's set to change the student experience? Or on I that? do yeah I think the young people's experience of life in general is changing and how they experience education is changing with it and how we're, we're experiencing the workplace is changing with it just today, yesterday, I was talking with our director of IT services and, you know, we, we're talking about the physical campus, which we're all so proud of, and it's a beautiful campus for sure. Uh, and that, that's a, a kind of Trinity experience. And we were discussing what's the, the digital experience like for students who've never been to the campus. Now, this is, of course, an exception of the pandemic. This won't usually be the case. But we have students who haven't been to the campus. What's their experience of Trinity? Well, at the moment, it's entirely mediated through digital we have to think about how that works and in some ways it works well, as you'll know from your own alumni relations activities. There are ways indeed, this webinar being an example of it, where we can connect with alumni and, um, and reinforce and develop the community spirit quite well uh, using digital technologies. We should do more of it, uh, but it's not a replacement or in any way a substitute for some of the physical activities. Like I do miss, uh, um, like it's a terrible pity we couldn't have run the scholars dinner uh, last year and we won't be able to do it again this year two scholars dinners one year after the other that we can't run with the you know the, the new scholars have their first big outing in their in their black tie and their you know and, and so on uh, and alumni scholars from previous generations and decades come back and they all meet each other you know it's a great occasion that can can't easily be I would say it can't be at all reproduced online. Um, so that's an example of something we miss. We all miss it. I miss, I miss going on commons. I miss even going over to these dining hall at lunchtime. I miss going for a cup of coffee in the common room. And, you know, I miss you know, going around to, to Lincoln once in a while for, for, a, uh, for a pint. These are things that uh, uh, we will get back when the pandemic is over. But we'll continue doing, I would say, webinars like this as well. So the world will change and we'll change with it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a few questions from some people who sent them in in advance, provost. We have a question from Gillian Quinn, who, as you know, is the chairperson of the TCD Association and Trust. Hello, Gillian. It's around, <laughs> it's around the current debate on university governance. So the question is, the the independence and unique position and governance of Trinity College is highly treasured. Do you think that the college could survive without government aid? And what impact could this have on the future shape of college? Well, there's a few questions there. I do think indeed Trinity College could survive if government pulled the plug and there was no government money. 40% of our revenues come from the state. Um, and that includes revenues that come in for education, the subvention of the teaching of Irish students and for research. Um, if we didn't have it, we'd have to change a lot of things, but we would indeed survive. But I don't know that we would flourish. Uh, Trinity College is a public university. Uh, I think that's an honourable thing to be. The vast majority of universities in Europe are public universities and uh, uh, it's... Uh, an honourable position to be in, to be a public university um, in receipt of government funding. Um, <clears throat> what we should aim for is a, a respectful relationship with the state on both sides, us respecting them, they respecting us and our independence. 
and not just uh, because Trinity is a, has a particular legal structure, but rather uh, respecting Trinity's independence because of the value it brings to the country and to the world. That independence that Trinity has allows us to set our curriculum, allows us to uh, decide research priorities, allows us to uh, work and, 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 and engage uh, publicly in debate in a way that we wouldn't be able to do were we just another uh, state-controlled institution. So independence and autonomy of universities has a value in a democratic society. That's why we want to keep it. And that's why I believe the government will also want to keep it. And the governance um, reforms, as they would call them, um, do offer some opportunities to improve our governance in Trinity. And we'll be ready to take those. And we're in continuous dialogue with the minister and his key officials to see how uh, the reforms that are being proposed can take account of Trinity's uh, traditions and uh, equally importantly, its unique legal structure as being a cooperation of the Provost Fellows and Scholars. And what's the time frame on, on that? Like when will we know? Um... Oh, meetings are happening weekly, literally. I would say, uh, well, the Minister says he plans his heads of bill in April. And this is a very quick timeline. After that, it will go, uh, um, <clears throat> so heads of bill to cabinet uh, this month or next. And after that, then it goes uh, to the Oireachtas. And then it goes to various Oireachtas committees for debate and discussion where it could be modified. Uh, and at the very, very earliest it could be done would be the end of this calendar year. And that is his timeline, though I suspect it might run into the following calendar year. Thank you. Um, we've had a few questions in around um, diversity and inclusion. For example, um, one from Tim. I read in the last alumni e-zine about how college is going to conduct an investigation into its links with slavery and colonialism. Is Berkeley about to be cancelled? George Berkeley, um, well, uh, this is a good thing to do for a start. Uh, it's a good piece of history. I am happy that there are historians that, that do work in this and, you know, colonialism and slavery had abounded in, in the years, in, in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, uh, and Trinity's uh, connection with them, if any, is worth uh, deliberating and finding out more about. And that's what um, some college historians uh, are going to do. Um, and I support them very much in, in doing that. Uh, you know, colonialism and Trinity, uh, you know, there was a time when something like over 1% of the land area of Ireland was uh, owned by Trinity College. And Trinity got revenues from that. Um, and people would see that as a link to colonialism in itself, quite apart from uh, uh, what might have happened in the days of the British Empire. Let's look into it and see. As regards George Berkeley, he's an interesting character, of course. He, he a brilliant philosopher and did his great work when he was a student and fellow here in Trinity College, work that I understand philosophers today uh, regard very highly. Um, he did go to the United States, of course, and buy slaves. And that's uh, a matter of historical record. And uh, those slaves that he bought, um, he renamed with Christian names and baptized them and so on. Uh, I didn't know that until recently. Um, and then when he left uh, the United States, the slaves uh, were sold on or donated on. Uh, we think the Yale University. Uh, now, not every Irish person that went to the United States in those days, and we're talking the you know, early to mid 1700s, bought slaves. So what he did was... Uh, was not normal, not the normal thing at least, and it's worthwhile looking into more. Um, perhaps also it's worth looking into why in 1960, so this is moving a few centuries forward, we did name, I think 1966, the Barclay Library was named after George Barclay. And this was presumably known, but didn't cause anyone any concerns then. Maybe it shouldn't cause us any concerns now. Let's have a debate and discussion about it. One thing's for sure, um, when the students bring these things up, and it's the students who brought it up with me, it would be wrong for me to say, 
you know, get out of my office. I'm not going to discuss this. I'm not going to let anyone else discuss it either. It's a, a it's not a subject for debate. Let's have a debate. First of all, let's get let's uh, establish what this, the true situation is with the historical project, and then let's have a debate and a discussion about uh, about George Berkeley. Uh, I suspect that we'll conclude that he was indeed a brilliant philosopher, uh, and that uh, there's every good reason to continue with the name of the Berkeley Library for the Berkeley Library. But let's not prejudge things. Okay. And then um, we have a question from Aoife who asks, why did it take so long to have female sculptures in the long room? And I suppose I'd add on to that and say, is that an issue that students pressed on or, or was that something? Well, why did it take so long? Well, first, um, it, it, uh, I mean, in a way, it's a good question, uh, but not one that I can answer because, you know, I wasn't here. The, the, the library was, was opened in 1750, whatever it was, so there's lots of hundreds of years past, and you'd be as well to ask the provost of those times, why not? I suspect it didn't even occur to them, uh, but it occurred to me, and uh, that's why we've initiated this project and got the funding for it to have um, uh, sculptural busts of women in the old library. I think it's going to look great. Uh, the, the commission is about to be um, uh, decided. Uh, and uh, hopefully within the next year, we will have these unveiled in the old library. The librarian is very much up for it, Helen Shenton. Uh, we have a small committee looking in to see how this can be done. You know where they would be put in the, on the old library and so on, and, and 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 how they would fit in. So yeah, I think it's important, um, and because the old library is one of the most visible public spaces in the country, and we have forty busts, twenty on this side and twenty on that side, all of men. I think there probably was a time, Jennifer, when people didn't even notice, but now they notice, and I notice, and our students notice, and staff notice. So let's do something about it, now that we and can. Can you share the names again with us, just for? Yeah, um, uh, Lady Gregory, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft uh, are two of the names, Ada Lovelace and um, uh, Rosalind Franklin. We we'll so. look forward to that. Um, I'm going to move- I bet um, you don't know who Ada Lovelace is though. Pardon? I bet you don't know who Ada Lovelace is. She a scientist? Yeah, yeah. Ada Lovelace, I I'm, I'm, shouldn't be asking you the questions. I know that, that you're supposed to be asking me. But Ada Lovelace um, wrote the, the, the first computer program ever written was written by a woman, Ada Lovelace. And uh, so I'm delighted. That I had a petition. I must have had 200 emails from students saying one of the sculptural busts in the old library should be Ada Lovelace. So I was delighted that that uh, won through in the end as one of the four. Good. Uh, pity you didn't ask me about Mary Wollstonecraft instead as a as a Russian <laughs> graduate. But anyway, um, a question in from John. Um, when I was in college, we heard very little about the rankings, even though we were in the top fifty. He doesn't say what year he was here. Um, now we hear a lot about the rankings, but the college's position is a lot worse. To what extent should I advise my children to pay attention to rankings when choosing a university? Um, I would say not much, frankly. But I know that many nonetheless do. Uh, rankings is really proportional to, to the money a university has. Um, so uh, I don't think there are any measure of really the quality of teaching that a university offers. And it's the quality of teaching that a university offers that I think should be a primary concern to a parent. Um, and Trinity College offers excellent uh, teaching, undergraduate and postgraduate levels. So that should be the thing that influences uh, most. Uh, rankings, unfortunately, can't be, can't be avoided. Uh, there's much that is probably to be criticized about rankings. The, the basket of KPIs that they use 
is not really reflective all the time of quality, but there is some nonetheless uh, correlation. And um, uh, I, I wouldn't steer my lights by rankings. Uh, I think that if you know a university well, your family has a, a tradition of, of attending that university. Uh, if you know about the values that that university has I, and you like them, then I wouldn't let rankings make my decision for me. And maybe there's another question coming in that I might be good to take now as well. Um, how do you see the relationship between university research and teaching over the coming decades? This is from Edward, who did engineering in 86. Ah, Edward, Edward Sweeney, maybe. Yes. <laughs> You know all the graduates personally, so there you go. Well, uh, we went to the same school, St. Peter's College of Oxford. But this is a really good question, and, and it wasn't a plant, <laughs> because oh. there is a great correlation between research and teaching. They go together hand in glove. You, know, you have to, to think that everything that's, that's taught in university is really the product of research, uh, research in this university or another, or uh, maybe even in many cases in advanced courses, the product of research of the individual teacher. So research is really central to, to, to teaching, in particular that students in a university should get the idea that, uh, that knowledge is not concreted in and the same forever, that it's changing, and that new knowledge uh, is always um, coming out. New, new knowledge is always the, the production of research. And that even indeed in their own discipline, as they, as they advance in the sophistry years or into postgraduate, they too have a responsibility in uh, generating new knowledge for their discipline. I think that, so it's really, a, the two of them are so, are so combined that I, I always mention them, if I can, in the same breath. You know, education and research go together, a common mission, uh, the common mission of a university. And you can't really, in my world, do one without the other. I think, hope that answers uh, your question there. No, that definitely wasn't a plant, even though it may have sounded like it. Um, okay, promise, moving on a little bit um, to philanthropy now, um, so I can see some questions coming in um, and I'll go to them once I ask the establishment questions on, on this. So Trinity is in the midst of a major philanthropic campaign, campaign inspiring generations to raise 400 million in private donations. What are the main projects that are going to be funded by this? And in what way are they set to be transformational? Three main capital projects and one that runs across them all. Three main capital projects are first, the old library redevelopment project. This is a key thing I want to get done in the four months remaining in my provership. We're going to redevelop the old library. We're going to take the shop out of the old library and put it in the, underneath the Berkeley podium. And the whole ground floor of the old library is uh, going to be transformed. One part of it into a research collection study center and another part into a, uh, um, a place for the display of the Book of Kells and uh, uh, the treasures of the old library. And then the environmental controls needed for fire safety and to preserve the collections of the old library are going to be put in. This is an expensive project. It's going to cost 93 million euro. We're very hopeful that the state will join us. And I hope to be able to make an announcement about that um, in supporting the old library redevelopment. Uh, I think all graduates will be proud when they see the plans for this, which we already have planning permission for. Uh, and uh, to, to really safeguard the old library and its contents for future generations. Second, um, E3, close to my own heart, of course, I'm an engineer and uh, you know, that's important to me. E3 stands for Engineering, Environment and Emerging Technologies. And we're going to expand the provision of engineering, computer science and environmental science and natural science education through the E3 project. Uh, building the E3 Learning Foundry building here on the main campus and on our Trinity East campus down at Grand Canal Dock, which is our new campus, the E3 Research Institute. This will very much expand educational opportunities in the area of engineering, computer science and natural sciences and uh, massively increase Trinity's research into key areas of uh, engineering and computer science. And then the third capital project is the Trinity St. James Cancer Institute 
Most people, most alumni will know St. James's Hospital is the biggest hospital in the state and it's a Trinity teaching hospital based in Dublin 8. And together we have created the Trinity St. James Cancer Institute to provide for Ireland its first ever comprehensive cancer care centre. Comprehensive cancer care centres are the vanguard of providing excellent cancer care for a population uh, and can introduce the latest new drugs and so on into cancer care through clinical trials. At the moment, um, Trinity and St. James's uh, patients, they're only less than 2%, maybe about 1.5% of patients are on clinical trials. Modern comprehensive cancer care centres would have up to 10% and sometimes 20% of their patients on uh, cancer trial drugs. And we want to have this capability to do advanced comprehensive cancer care in Ireland. And the best bet for that in Ireland is a combination between Trinity College and St. James Hospital. So those are the three projects and across them all are scholarships, access and uh, uh, new lectureships and professorships across all three of those disciplines and indeed uh, others. That's how I would summarize inspiring generations. So there's a lot in it. And um, with the first um, one you mentioned there, the library, um, you mentioned philanthropic support and government support. Is that the same for the other, for E3 and for the Trinity St. James's Cancer Institute too? Are they, are they a mix of both sources? They are. Uh, the model that I've always tried to run in my own mind is financing these projects with a mixture of philanthropy and borrowing. We can borrow uh, at very good rates from the European Investment Bank. So philanthropy and borrowing is, is the Trinity bunch of money, call it X, and get that matched or more than matched by the state makes these projects possible. So really what gets the ball rolling is the philanthropy. That we can, we can borrow to match that and the state leverages it up to funding sufficient to carry through the capital project. And I'm pleased to say that work for the E3 Learning Foundry. Uh, we're close to perhaps having it ready also for the uh, E3 Research Institute and our new campus at Grand Canal Dock. And as I say, I hope before I finish to be able to have that in place also for the old library redevelopment. The Trinity St. James Cancer Institute is a longer process and uh, won't be done by the end of my tenure in July, but we'll be well on the way to having um, uh, formally launched our collaboration with St. James's. That's already in the planning. Although we've, we've had informally the collaboration working very well for a number of years, we've decided to take it to the next level and have a, a legal agreement between us. And that will allow uh, a new governance structure to come in for the Trinity St. James Cancer Institute that will allow us to further progress the capital project. Okay, and um, we have a, two questions in here about Trinity's relationship with industry. And the first actually refers a bit more to um, Trinity East, which you mentioned there. Um, what is the timetable? This is from David. And um, what is the timetable on the new innovation center being fully functional? And what support are the global tech companies with bases in Ireland providing for research at Trinity and the innovation center in particular? The board uh, at its meeting in March made a decision that we would uh, uh, take a Trinity-led approach to the development of our campus at, uh, at Grand Canal Dock called Trinity East. Um, what that really means is that we won't work with the developer to finance most of the project. We will take it slower and do it over time. So the truth is it's probably going to take uh, decades, several properships to fully uh, complete our campus at Trinity East. We will, we've already begun though, the, the first uh, project is an early activation center using various buildings we have on the Trinity East campus to provide uh, a hub for spin out and startup companies and also landing ground for uh, research activities of multinationals. That's already beginning and we have the money for that already. It's a, an 8 million euro project and we're, it's in progress. And if you come to Dublin and look at that site in, in a couple of months time, you'll see the, the building works beginning. The bigger, next big project there is the E3 Research Institute. And it's going to take some years before that project is breaking ground, so to speak. Uh, we're still 
uh, uh, in the process of getting that project financed. It will need government funding, public funding, significant public funding to get it off the ground. If we succeed in getting public funding, we also have uh, excellent philanthropy that we're about to announce for, uh, for the E3 Research Institute at Trinity East. So the answer to your question, Jennifer, is there are several parts of the project in progress, but the long term, we've decided, the board has decided that to take a, to take a long term view in developing that site as a campus, as a university campus, not a set of office blocks. It's not a, it's not a property play. It's, a, it's going to be an extension and development of the main campus done carefully and with lots of deliberation over time. That's um, a good comprehensive answer to a few questions that were coming in on the same team. So thank you. Um, I'm going to move now to a comment slash question slash invitation from Henry O oh in Hong Kong. Um, hi, Paddy. Hey, having ha you know, <coughs> Excuse me, he says, thank you for all graduate. your efforts and contribution to Trinity, especially for alumni over here in Asia. I'm sure I'll meet you again when I'm back. I still want to ask, will you come visit us in Hong Kong after COVID? And, and here's the, the question now, will there be any further strategy to extend the academic relationship building in the rest of the world? Uh, well, I, I look very much look forward to visiting again, uh, Henry in, in Hong Kong. I look forward to it very much. I remember um, the very nice dinner we had last time we were there in your in your club, I think it was. Um, now, of course, we're in the hands of a new provost here. Uh, I think the, the three candidates who are debating as we uh, this webinar clashes with their with their debate. But one thing they all agree on is uh, Global Trinity continuously engaging with the rest of the world. Trinity is not only an Irish university, it is that for sure. It's not just a Dublin university, it's a university for the world. A university that really is on the world stage. And over the last 10 years of my provostship, I'm pleased that we've been able to further develop that with uh, engagement with institutions around the world, including in Hong Kong, where we have uh, joint programs um, and joint research programs and with alumni around the world, of course, who are in, what is it, Jennifer, 140 countries around the world. So this, this, this is going to continue with pace. Uh, everyone agrees that this is uh, it's great for Trinity, great for all students on the campus that we have, a, a college that draws students from around the world, and great for our academics that they have engagements with other universities and industries around the world. That's, after all, what a, a properly global university is and everyone benefits from it. So yes, absolutely. And I look forward very much. I should like to, to do a little, you know, maybe I can do a trip around the world when COVID is over, <laughs> visiting everyone. I'd love to do that. Maybe Jennifer, the... Jennifer and alumni relations can uh, persuade me to do that when I'm- Well, we, we brought, um, I remember when you came in uh, to the role, we brought you on a, a tour of the chapters, but um, so, and speaking of which, um, you've met loads of alumni over the past 10 years, and I know you've always been clear to define the college community as staff, students and alumni. Um, so alumni are still part of the community. They're not a separate community. From your point of view, and as a graduate yourself, what are the benefits of alumni engagement? Well, what have the benefits been to the college um, recently and what are the benefits to the graduate? Well, I think the benefits to uh, the college are massive from engagement with alumni. Um, and that's, you know, we talk about being a, a university for the world or a global university, but our, our, our footprint in the world is our alumni. And uh, so Trinity's presence in the world and um, its, its place in the world it's really determined by alumni. Um, I, I wrote a forward to a book some years ago on the provost of Trinity College. And there's, you know, I'm the 44th provost and this book had all, all earlier provosts. And uh, I, I reflected in it, none of the provosts are very famous. Maybe Mahaffey, uh, I suppose, is a little bit famous. 
So Trinity College is not made, made really famous by its provosts or, or even indeed its, its, its academic staff or its professional staff. It's the alumni, it's the graduates out there in the world that are really the essence of what Trinity College is about. And, and so you know, it's, it's, it's like uh, asking, you know, Jennifer asked me, what, what, what about alumni? It's like asking me, what, what about my arms, you know? This is part of the body of the university, and um, it's good that the statutes were changed to have that. The Trinity, the Trinity College community is, is students, staff, and alumni. I would have thought it was obvious, but it was good, good to have it written in there. Um, the college benefits greatly from these relationships, actually. Uh, one of the most tangible ways is when a, students, for example, when Erasmus students or when, when our undergraduates go on placements abroad, oftentimes they're uh, helped settle in in wherever they go by alumni in that city who maybe meet the money once or twice, but it's good that, that they know that there's a, a community for them there to fall back on if they should ever need it. Uh, and that's uh, probably, you know, th those kind of things are the most important for, for an alumni network that provides a kind of an encouragement uh, in a way for us who are working back here uh, in, in the college on a day-to-day -day basis to know that we have out there in the wider world the support of our alumni. I hope that's not too philosophical. No, well, we definitely do have their support and we've recently reached um, 150,000 volunteer hours from alumni. So they'd be alumni who, um, you know, sit on advisory boards or act as mentors, etc. So it's 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 great that they're they're giving in that way. I'm going to ask you perhaps to to just to move away from Trinity for one second and to think more broadly about the third level sector in Ireland um, and indeed the fourth level uh, sector. Um, you've spent the majority of your career, almost all your career in education. Um, so if you were to think about the sector now uh, in this year, how optimistic would you feel about it? And what do you think are the main challenges for the sector? I won't surprise you to know I'm optimistic about it. I'm an optimist by nature. So I think what universities offer, what higher education offers is something in great demand. They don't see any slack off of it. And a couple of years ago, there was talk of it. You know, people would say, ah, what's the good of a university degree? You know, is my earning power really improved by doing a bachelor's or a master's? Maybe I'd be just as well to go into the workforce. Some companies kind of support this. Some of the very big companies will say, don't bother getting a degree. We don't care what your degree is. Come to us and we'll, we'll teach you. Despite all of that, people will want to come to universities. This year, Trinity College had a 40% increase in the number of CAO applicants. 40%. We've never had an increase like it ever. Sometimes it increments up a couple of percent, but this year, a 40% increase in the number of applicants. Now, we're oversubscribed anyway, so an increase in the number of applicants won't make much difference to us. We, we fill all our places in any case, but it does, it goes to show how much young people and their parents uh, want to go to university. And that's um, how young people want to go to university and their parents want to support them in that. So higher education, uh, you know, if you use demand as your only metric, it is in good shape. However, Perhaps uh, that's not the only metric, and there are other, other things that should cause us to reflect about higher education. And um, perhaps to the uh, uh, relationship between in higher education and other aspects of the further education system need to be better developed. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, after, after the leaving cert or after high school, secondary school, students can do a variety of things. It's not very good if every student in Ireland wants to come to Trinity to do law I mean, or medicine and a point shoot up and you have all these unhappy students who didn't get the courses that they wanted, many of whom would not be suited maybe for being a doctor or a lawyer, but are kind of doing it because they want it for prestige reasons. I think uh, that that is a, is a worry, be a worry for me that the higher education system worldwide is not thinking more about uh, what is good for young people, but rather putting them under pressure to go to a small number of high prestige universities. And therefore many young people end up feeling like they're failures 
when really they're far from it and their talents could be much better used in in another way than going to university. So, so uh, yeah, that, that is something to think about. And we, to that, to that, maybe another, another side to that, some university presidents in Ireland, and I know one anyway, who, when the points come out every year for the courses, he looks at the points and he says, oh, some of my courses, the points have gone up. And if in a year where the majority of points go up in the course, in his courses, he's happy. He thinks this is a measure of quality. I don't even look at the points. Now that's, uh, it's not what it's about. It's about universities um, uh, offering opportunities for young people that they can uh, genuinely take advantage of that helps them to develop their lives as well as their careers and ultimately gets them to, into situations where they can be happy in life. And I think perhaps if there's a if there's a, a downside to the to the optimism I expressed earlier, it's that there's too much of this um, uh, too too much prestige attaching to a small number of institutions, and that seems to be only getting worse. That young people and those advising them should see the broader opportunities that life offers, and higher education institutions and universities like ours should try to play our part in bringing that about. It is, it is an interesting issue and, you know, it's one that, you know, when you see the supplements that fall out of the newspaper saying for the secondary schools, who went to which college, how many went on to the third level, you know, it does, it's almost, it's almost a little bit like the rankings almost, you know, it's, it's reducing something to, um, to, to one very small aspect of, of what it really should be about. Um, Professor, moving into another um, phase of this interview now, um, there's lots and lots of questions coming in um, asking the highlights of the last 10 years, the challenges of the last 10 years. Um, the, you know, there's a few that are all sort of asking that in the same way and what you might have done differently if you'd known then what you know now. Um, so we might just take them in turn and, and we, can be, we can be brief with them if you want. So the, the highlights of the last 10 years. Well, there are so many. And I, I find it hard to put my finger on one thing to say this is a standout highlight of, of everything. But one, um, one, one event that did uh, shape my provostship was in this very room here. I'm in the library of, of, of the provost house. And I was here with one of our great supporters, um, uh, Martin Nocton. And I, I've always wanted to do this important project for engineering and computer science and natural sciences called E3. I mentioned it earlier, engineering, energy and the environment. Uh, I really think that, that it's important for universities. So many students want to study the subject. So many employers want to employ uh, people who've done engineering, computer science and natural sciences. And the universities are in the middle. It's only by increasing capacity in the universities can we meet the both the ambitions of the students and uh, uh, employers and wider society uh, and I asked uh, Martin for an amount of money I won't mention it here it's widely known anyway but it's, it was three times larger, uh, almost three times larger than any other philanthropic donation given by an individual and <laughs> I, was so, I was so nervous asking for this amount of money that I had a piece of paper and I had to read out what was written on it you know, Martin, I would like to ask for your support for the relative amount of money. And, uh, and I, I thought, this is, God, what's he going to say? And he was quiet for a while. And I thought, oh, that was too much. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and then he just turned around and he said, I'll do it. And he shook my hand. I remember that. <laughs> but it's, and it's not just about the money. It's about the opportunity it brings. Uh, for Trinity and, 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 you know, for the university overall. And it couldn't have happened without a lead philanthropic donation. And afterwards, the state came in to match Martin's money. And now we're, we have a, a great uh, project that's you know, only getting going because it's, it's going to continue. Um, things that, I, you know, there are, I'm very proud too of the Trinity Education Project. 
which had a fundamental review of the undergraduate curriculum, brought us back, I think, to something that we used to be in the past with more coherence to the undergraduate curriculum that all students in the university, all, we take in about 2,000 undergraduates every year. After the Trinity Education Project, they all share something in common because they can all choose from the same pool of electives. I think that's a great, uh, you know, Trinity really got ahead of the game when it came to undergraduate education through the Trinity Education Project. Um, you want a downside from me as well. I shouldn't well, be, to be honest, I should give one negative, and I will. Some, some things I'm unhappy about, and I, or I came to too late to, to fix, is, is, is the students' access to, to parts of the campus. You go around to some of the research labs now, and they've got combination locks on the doors, and the students can't go in. Some buildings are locked, and the students can't go in. When I was an undergraduate, you could wander around this university to anywhere. We could have gigs in the buttery. We could go into the museum building and climb up onto the roof. Now, that's dangerous and we shouldn't have been doing that, but there was a certain freedom to the student activity in the university that for one reason or another has, has, has been lost. A student said to me that when she goes into the arts block and buys a cup of coffee and she says, and it's far too expensive, it's my daughter, one of them, and she sits down beside somebody, it's, in, it's invariably not someone who, who's a student. And I can remember going into the arts block to the coffee dock there and buy your terrible coffee and you sit down where you talk to someone and it'll invariably be another student in another course. So the university has lost something of the intimacy that comes with, uh, with that. And I, and I think we have to work hard to get it back. Um, that's actually a, an interesting one because we did have a, a question with them. Um, we are getting out of time there about um, the number of tourists in Front Square. Someone who said they felt like the campus was theirs when they when they were there. And I, I know exactly what you mean. I remember wandering around the JCR and House One and it, just the freedom there. But um, they're saying now they love to go back. I'm just reading it here. They say they love to go back on campus and whenever they're back in Dublin. But sometimes they feel there's more tourists than students. But well, they, should know, come in. they should come in now during COVID because, of course, <laughs> The only people in here now are students and staff. In fact, I was sitting out on a deck chair. There's deck chairs now in Front Square and uh, on Library Square. And I was sitting out with a friend of mine on deck chairs. And there were students on, on their own deck chairs. And one of them came over to us and says, Provost, uh, I'm doing the crossword and I'm not able to get nine down. And, it, and we did the crossword together. And it, that, that can't happen when Front Square is full of tourists because in, invariably we wouldn't see each other or I wouldn't know that they were students. So yeah, so whoever that is should Power drop me an email and they can come in. We we'll get them a little pass to get in <laughs> and they can wander around the college and it'll feel very much like it was when the only people going around were those in residence. Okay. Um, well, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up. So I'll just ask one more question, but I will say there's loads more we could have asked. There's also a huge number of invitations coming in um, to go all over the place. Invitation to Dubai, invitation to... So, um, I love Dubai. Yeah, your next uh, few years are, are taken care of. Um, so just the final question promised, um, this Saturday, 10th of April, we'll know who the 45th Provost of Trinity will be. What advice would you give them? <laughs> well, uh, what advice? I, I, that's a, well, first, I, I kind of depend on who the person is because I know all three candidates very well and they've all worked um, in my administration in the college over the last three years, running very good campaigns. Whichever one it will be, uh, will be excellent. We've got three really experienced, uh, brilliant uh, candidates for provostship and uh, uh, whoever gets it, I, I wish them well. Uh, I won't be quick to be saying do this, do that, or give advice. Um, but one thing I will say is, uh, and I don't think they'll need to hear it from me because they know it anyway, is get out on the road and talk to alumni around the world. They're among the most informed people because they know the college because they were here, uh, but also because they've had careers and lives outside the university can look in and give very good advice. At the beginning of my provostship, we held something called the Trinity Global Graduate Forum, if you remember, and I think the end of the first year. And that Trinity Global Graduate Forum really gave me the ideas that fueled me forward 
for the next uh, 10 years of the provostship. And maybe if I was to give a piece of advice, I'd say hold another global graduate forum, reach out to the alumni. That's where the great ideas are. Uh, and think about how the next phase of Trinity's development uh, uh, can, be, can succeed and be supported uh, through uh, advice of alumni. Thank you very much, Provostan. And that wasn't planted either, even though it sounds like I, we said it. Provostan, that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank you so much on behalf of all of us here at Trinity Development and Alumni and on behalf of the alumni community. Thank you for sharing your thoughts about your achievements over the last 10 years and about your legacy. And um, we really appreciate it. So now I'm going to hand back over to Michael for some closing remarks. Thank you, Jennifer, and, and thank you again, Provost. That was an absolutely fantastic discussion, really insightful. I know the quote I'll be taking away from it is that our footprint in the world is our alumni. I think that rings true for everyone working in the alumni office. Um, before we go, I'd just like to very quickly once again thank the Provost and our amazing MC and host, Jennifer, as well as my colleagues, Siobhan Brady and Aoife Brady, who've been working behind the scenes, making today possible. Um, and I'd also like to thank each and every one of you who listened and tuned in today for all of your engaging and insightful comments and thank yous and invitations and questions. It's been really great to have you all here. Um, and before we go, I'd just like to share two upcoming webinars with everyone. But before that, if you have any questions or comments about this webinar or the webinar series or anything else in general that we can help you with at the alumni office, please email us at alumni.tcd.ie. We're always delighted to hear from you. So. Our next webinar in the Inspiring Ideas series will be in two weeks time. Uh, it'll be on Wednesday, the 21st of April at 1 p.m. And it's entitled From Brexit to Biden to Brussels, Ireland and Change in the EU and USA. Um, so join us on Wednesday, the 21st for a discussion between Gail McElroy, Professor of Political Science at Trinity, uh, who will lead a discussion with Tony Connolly, who is RTE's Europe editor, and Rory Carroll, who is The Guardian's Ireland correspondent, and they will be exploring the practical implications of the new political reality we find ourselves in. So that's gonna be a fantastic conversation and the registration link for that will be circulated next week. So keep an eye on your inboxes for that. And I'd also like to remind you all of our next Future Cities webinar, which will be focusing on London. And that will be taking place on April the 28th at 1 p.m. London time. And that will feature three also highly distinguished speakers, Dr. Brian Caulfield, Associate Professor in the Department of Civil, Structural and Environmental Engineering here at Trinity, Dr. Sarah Pritchard, the UK Managing Director and Partner at Bureau Happold Engineering, and Vincent Keaveney, Partner at DLA Piper. And that webinar will focus on the impact of climate change on urban planning and architecture, the increasingly important role of technology in our daily lives and buildings, local innovations and government projects that are already starting to shape our smart communities and so many other topics. So make sure to keep that date in your calendar and you can see the entire Future Cities lineup at tcd.ie slash alumni slash news and events, Future Cities webinars. So thank you once again for joining us, everybody. Thank you again to the Provost for giving his time today. And we hope to welcome you all back to another webinar real soon. But in the meantime, please stay safe. <laughs>